Okay. Calling the meeting to order. This meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department, RMLD Board of Commissioners, is being videotaped at RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Massachusetts. And this meeting is being videotaped for distribution to the community television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. And our RMLD Commissioner's Code of Conduct, the RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the Chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the Chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the Board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the Chair, all persons addressing the Board shall state their name and address prior to, speak, prior to speaking. It is the role of the Chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. All right. Well, this is the first meeting of the new year. We've already got through a, a storm successfully <laughs> with very little fanfare, so that's good news. And I think we do have um, a public comment. We have somebody, is that true? We have a guest here that would like to say a few words? Yes, I would. Great. Like, thank you. Welcome up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is John Rogers, 39 Tower Hill Road in North Reading. Mm -hmm. uh, proud Reading Light customer for close to two decades now. All right. uh, and I just, I, I had emailed you uh, a letter, and I hope, hope you all received that, just talking some about the solar policy. By, by way of quick background, I work in this industry. I, I started in the industry uh, 20 seven years ago, something like that. For the last 11 years, I've been working for a nonprofit on, on policy uh, analysis and, and advocacy. I work for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, I am also the proud owner of a, a solar system, which I put on a little over a year ago. Uh, went very smoothly, looks beautiful, all that. When I got my first bill from Reading Light post-solar installation, I was rather surprised. And, and so I thought about it for a while. And then uh, the letter I wrote you is, is talking about what I saw as uh, challenges with the, the what, what I was experiencing, um, I think a better way, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about that, I think the, the better way to use my, my uh, brief remarks here is to say that I think there are, there are, uh, there are essentially three points. One is that the, the policy, I think as it now stands, uh, I think is in need of updating. Uh, and the second point is that if you look at uh, are uh, that that uh, sorry, it's it's out of step I think with what so many of our neighbors, all of our neighbors, neighboring municipal MLPs, <coughs> are doing in terms of treatment of, of rooftop solar, of residential solar. Uh, it's the the second point is that fixing it I believe is in Reading Lights RMLD's best interest, and I can ex I can explain that. Uh, and the third thing is that fixing it is easy again because our Neighbors have wrestled with these same issues, have dealt with the same concerns about cost, cost shifts, uh, value of solar, all that, and come to conclusions. Uh, and some of them look very similar to RMLDs with, with slight, slight tweaks that, again, I think reflect more, uh, would reflect more of an updating to Reading's policy than a, than a wholesale change in that. Uh, what I have here, by your leave, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. uh, if I can share these, these are... Uh, these are just excerpts from the policies of, of each of the neighboring municipalities. Uh, I think there's one for there. You too, Colleen. That's all right. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Make sure I have my copy. Actually, I could use one of those copies back. I think we do we have an extra one. I was one? too we do. generous with my, uh, we'll yeah, my paper. <clears throat> so basically, uh, so that first point, if I could elaborate, if I, I don't know, I, I don't want to take much of your time. I know oh, you, you have a ahead. lot of issues. But the first point, so if you read Reading's, which is the top one on that first page, 
It talks about during a billing period what happens. If you look at Ipswich, it's, it's virtually identical language. They talk about the customer as being the customer generator, so understanding the shifting role there. Um, but what they then go on to explain is that what they meant by during a billing period was that they will do a monthly reconciliation. They'll say, how many kilowatt hours did we get from you? How many kilowatt hours did we give you? And they'll look at that net, and then once a year in March, I believe, end of March, they will true it up so that they don't have this sort of balance that's uh, continuing year after year after year. Right. So that's, that's pretty standard. So what, uh, and, I, uh, and uh, Jane and I were talking some ahead of time, um, what I think, if I, if I could conjecture for a moment, um, and Jane may <laughs> disagree with this, but um, what I believe is that when, when, when this policy was first put in place during a billing period meant monthly reconciliation. And so when I read this before I installed my system, I said, okay, if I generate 800 kilowatt hours and I use 600 kilowatt hours, I get that this tells me I'll, pay five, I'll get paid five cents for that overage that month. So again, I generate this much, I use this much. How is that overage credited? What Ipswich does is it rolls that over to the next month. What Peabody does is it rolls that over to the next month. What Wakefield does is gives you the full value for that. What Danvers does is it rolls it over to the next month. But I got that Reading was doing something a little different. I, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's the way to do it, but I got that. What I think happened in the intervening years after this policy was developed, um, and uh, or at some point, we got these meters that were a whole lot more sophisticated than what were envisioned here. So now suddenly it wasn't on a monthly, you know, it used to be you had somebody come by with a clipboard, read it at the end of the month and say, you use this many kilowatt hours. That's changed. Now we've got AMI, we've got meters that can tell us essentially instantaneously. And so that's what has happened now is that I am getting not, not at the end of the month a reconciliation, not at the end of the year a reconciliation. I'm getting every, I don't know, five minutes, every hour, every minute, every, I can't tell if it's instantaneous or what, but there's this reconciliation happening. Again, as envisioned, except not as envisioned because it became, thanks to the advance of technology, it became uh, on so much more a fine a scale. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the first point is that, our, again, ours is out of step with Ipswich, with Peabody, with Danvers, with Wakefield, uh, certainly with Massachusetts as a whole, we'll ignore the IOUs for the moment. Uh, Marblehead didn't have anything useful, it didn't have, it didn't, I couldn't find anything. Middleton, I found nothing about their policy. But all the others that I could think of in the area, that's what, so that's the first point, that, that I think this just needs to be updated to reflect where we are with the technology. I, I do think that, um, uh, some of these other models are, are actually better even than a, just a straight reinterpretation of our language. The second point that fixing it is inter in the interest of Reading Light, Jane and I were talking about sort of the gives and takes. What does it cost Reading Light to have me as a customer with solar? Um, and if you look from an energy perspective, I get it. Sometimes I'm using, I'm using energy from the system, I'm using the distribution system, the wires for that, those wires have to be paid for. What's missing from that equation is the capacity value that I provide, that my system provides. And I can tell you that on an August afternoon, if my system is generating at peak, I will have more than paid for the, the whole, anything you want to think about in terms of what Reading Light has given me for my system being there. If I'm, uh, so the math, a, a, a megawatt avoided, and this is why the Shred the Peak program is so exciting and why it's been effective, why well, it's been effective to tackle this. A megawatt avoided is something like $200,000. Last year it was, or the year before. Last year, last year. So maybe it's 140,000, something like that. But if you do that math and you, you take that down to my seven kilowatt system, if my seven kilowatts, and, and granted it won't always be producing right at that instantaneous uh, moment when, when we need it most, but on average, if you look at your portfolio of rooftop solar systems out there, if they produce at the right moment, they avoid, the, they avoid, they save for every customer of Reading Light that amount throughout the entire year just by virtue of the fact that they were producing at that moment, avoiding those megawatts, avoiding those kilowatts. 
So that's the second point. And the third point is that fixing it is easy because, again, I think we have great models in our neighbors. I would recommend, uh, you know, the Ipswich, when they true up, they pay the PPFA plus one cent. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, some, some, do, some might do better than that. Some use the, uh, the uh, LMP, the real-time LMP average, you know, what did it really cost to provide power in a given area. So, but again, there's a model right there. So what I would ask for from the commission is consideration of either an adoption of something like Ipswich's policy or just Ipswich's policy wholesale, or a, uh, a return to this notion that if we're doing this true up, it's on a monthly basis, not every second of every day. Because again, I think, uh, I don't know what your predecessors were, th were thinking uh, when they put this policy, but I am guessing that they were not uh, that, that they had in mind the monthly billing that we had had for decades. So, again, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these things, about my original letter, about these, uh, what we're seeing from neighboring MLPs or Okay. Well, well, thank you, John. This is very good research that you put together. Um, does anybody have a question or comment for John? I don't know if Jane, if you. I, I have a question. I mean. What is the, what's the um, effect of this? You're saying the reconciliation on moment to moment versus monthly. What's, what does that add up to for you? What would it be for you versus this, what I take, if that's correct, that it's reconciling in real time, what's the difference for you? So, so I'm a, I, I, I was telling Jane, I'm, a, I'm, I'm virtually an ideal, ideal customer. We use a lot of power. We use it at night. My wife has an electric car. We charge it off peak. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, you know, we're just the kind of customer you want. What that means is when I'm generating, there's not a whole lot of power. I've done everything that Reading Light wanted me to do. I've swapped out my appliances. I've swapped out my light bulb. I've insulated my house. So again, not a whole lot of load during the day, during peak hours. So you're saying you're getting penalized where others aren't. So I'm getting the penalized, right. You're not getting penalized. You, you could look at it that way. If I were inefficient, if I were using more of that power, I would be saving, I would be avoiding sending power out at five cents a kilowatt hour, essentially the avoided fuel cost. That's what I'm getting paid. So of the 800 kilowatt hours I'm generating each month, 700 of it, well, actually, you did the math. Uh, That's 350 on average, you're selling gas. Uh, oh, because of? Fluctuations in the winter versus the summer. Yeah. So if you look at that, so that's what I'm getting paid five cents a kilowatt hour for instead of 15 cents or because I'm time of use, I, you know, we could even talk about me avoiding 18 cents uh, a kilowatt hour. Um, that's not what's happening. So I'm getting five cents a kilowatt hour. So if it was monthly reconciliation, which is that correct that that's what's happening in the other towns, that it's monthly, and and that here it's not monthly. Yeah. I guess, yeah, yeah. 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 When RMLE set up the rate back in 2010, um, we did anticipate that we, wouldn't, we, we had two channels on the meters. One channel measures everything that the customer purchases from the RMLD, and the other channel measures everything that the customer puts back. So in my conversation with Mr. Rogers, I do agree that there is some disconnects within the, res the renewable rate or the net metering rate. Uh, RMLD is not collecting, in my perspective, all the distribution charges. Uh, that the customer is avoiding by generating. So we still have the poles and wires and whatnot, and, and, and those charges aren't being collected. And there is a flaw that, you know, Mr. Rogers isn't getting the capacity credit. So the rate does have to be modified, but there's pluses and minuses on both sides. So the fact that, you know, we're only paying five cents, we're not really recovering the six cents that's part of the distribution charges that all of our customers are paying for the generation. Um, so we will be looking at the rate to do some modifications. Um, we did talk with other municipals, and there's municipals out there. Their model is if a customer um, puts energy back on the line, the municipal gives the customer nothing. So it does run the gamut from a zero contribution, something in the middle, to something as a full retail rate. Um, and it varies from municipality to municipality. So, you know, we're somewhere in the middle right now, and, you know, we will be looking at the rate to make sure that 
uh, adjustments are made on both sides because the RMLD strives to be cost of service. Uh, we talked about the last cost of service, a three to five year plan of trying to make those adjustments within customer classes and over the different customer classes, the residential, commercials, and all that type. So we, I, I do agree that it's not the perfect rate um, and then there is room for adjustments on both sides. If I could react, sure. Mr. Chairman. Sure. So I, I totally agree with Ms. Parento that uh, there are municipal examples out there that you could draw on to uh, come to really bad conclusions about what Reading Life should do. Um, I, won't, I won't name them. There are some in Massachusetts. You could go farther afield and find some really bad policies uh, in certain states that I won't, I won't name. Uh, I guess the, the point is when when you do, if you're going to do something, if you're going to attribute, most, most jurisdictions have concluded that uh, net metering is, is a rough approximation of the value of solar, and I, I mean true net metering. So kilowatt hour generated is a kilowatt hour uh, uh, avoided, should be compensated with an, a kilowatt hour. Uh, most, most jurisdictions conclude that that's probably a pretty good approximation when they do studies and they do studies of the value of solar and sometimes these are required sometimes utilities do them themselves sometimes third parties will do them when you add up not just the energy and it's not it's not the avoided fuel costs because I'm guessing on that summer afternoon when I'm generating <coughs> the fuel is costing us a lot more than the five cents a kilowatt hour so if you look at the fluctuation so you look at avoided energy costs if you look at avoided transmission and distribution costs, if you look at avoided capacity value, and again, that single one might pay for the, the whole kit and caboodle right there. If you look, so if you do a value of solar assessment, you bring in these other things, even if you ignore the environmental benefits, you can come to conclusions that show that this is, that solar is a good proposition, not just for the uh, arguably better for the utility than for the homeowner. I put in points why it didn't make sense for me as a homeowner to do it. In this case, I did it anyway. Uh, it was time to vote with my money. If you, uh, you know, it, from that perspective, if you look at what just happened on Monday, you may be aware that our president just slapped taxes on solar, solar imports. That's going to drive up the cost for people. We know that the policy in Massachusetts is changing. That's going to make it more expensive for people. So there's this, uh, there's this, tension or this, uh, there are these pushes to make it harder to do solar. What I'm asking for is for Reading Light to make it easier for people to do solar. Again, for the benefit of Reading Light and its customers. Do we, I want to make sure that we understand, that, that we who are here understand the problem as you've articulated it. Do, you, do we all, are we all clear on what the problem is that is being brought to us? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. So, so again, the problem is, Dave and Tom. Are, we, are we reconciling this on an annual basis, as most utilities in the, most munis in the area do? Are we doing it on a monthly basis, as our policy, as articula, as stated, would seem to suggest? Or are we doing that net, net, net on a, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, as has been implemented? And what I'm looking to for the uh, to the board for what I'm hoping for is clarification, and clarification that comes down on what I think the numbers would show. And again, we could launch a whole value of solar study. Most places use net metering, true net metering, retail net metering as a reasonable approximation until such time as another a different study comes. Have a comment? Yeah. So uh, I guess the only thing I'm not crystal clear on. So what what in fact causes the uh, difference by using the minute-to-minute -minute or whatever because Where, again where's the, where's the, where's the gap again I use if I use 800 kilowatt hours yeah sorry if I use 600 kilowatt hours in a month and I generate 800 is the difference between those 200 kilowatt hours on a, because it is on a monthly basis or is it uh, essentially 700 or whatever because I exported almost all of it to the grid that's the difference to the minute to minute. If it's a monthly thing, then you look at that. And again, that's not how our neighbors do it. They do it on an annual. They do month to month, but they roll it over. So they're saying, over the course of the year, you generated this much, you consumed this much, we're gonna give you a little bit for the extra, or we're gonna give you nothing. I mean, that isn't, there are ways munis deal with this. If there are, there are a variety of policies munis can use if they're worried about runaway solar, 
how many customers? We have 90 96 Six residential, residential customers. customers. We're not worried about runaway solar. <laughs> we have out, on, out of how many? 20,000? 20, 20,000, yeah. 20,000 meters, we have 96 customers. We're not in danger. This is at a time when uh, four utilities in Hawaii have more than 10% of their load being served by rooftop solar. This is at a time when California utilities are trying to figure out what to do because they're reaching, they're at times 50% of their generation. Something on that order is coming from solar. We're not there. We're not in danger there. We're not going to be. By the time, you know, if you look at projections out to 2030, very few utilities will have 10% solar penetration or anything, anything close to that. And Reading Light is not going to be one of those that's in danger of getting there. In part because we're giving other avenues. I mean, we're, we're satisfying that need for st the stability that comes from solar, for the greenness, whatever it is that's driving customers, Reading Light is giving, and, and, and again, I gave those the kudos, and I hope you saw that in the letter, and I meant that. Reading Light has been very forward thinking about a lot of different aspects. This is one more. This is why, you know, rooftop solar is something that people across the political spectrum get. You know, if you if you want to pitch it in terms of environmental, you could do that. If you want to pitch it in terms of cost stability, you can do that. If you want to pitch it and you see this with the, the Tea Party folks who love solar and they say don't, you know, you know, if you look at Georgia, a fascinating example of environmentalists and the Tea Party getting together to fight for rooftop solar because they get, this is energy independence. This is American, I mean, we're individualists. We're rugged individualists. Solar is part of that. We need to, we need to balance that with our, we have a collective utility. It's a municipal utility. So we can do that. Again, this is the, if you look at these other, this is how other munis have the conclusions that they have come to in terms of how to balance those interests. So again, there are ways to manage. If you're worried about runaway, runaway solarization, of North Reading, Reading, Wilmington, and uh, Linfield, uh, there are ways to manage that, or we can come back f five years from now and talk about ways to manage that because it's not an issue now. I will point out, you know, one of the things is if you look at Linfield, so your customers in Linfield, in your half of Linfield, uh, Peabody is the other half of Linfield. Peabody has a policy that is much friendly. So half of Linfield can do solar and feel really good about it. The other half is waiting for batteries to get cheap enough so that they can migrate off the grid or whatever they're thinking to, uh, to, so that they don't have to export power at five cents a kilowatt hour. And that is the next step. You know, if, if Reading Light doesn't have a policy that's friendly, the next step is for them, is for people to install batteries and then the step after that is going to be complete migration off the grid. We're not there yet. Uh, battery costs are coming down so quickly that we could definitely be there. And in fact, I mean, that's my next move uh, if, if, this, if, we can't, if we can't figure this out. And then I just keep it. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really, we really appreciate you coming forward and um, sharing this information with us. And it sounds like we're going to take a look at our metering policies and um, come to a, a solution. Good. And I'm happy to come back as a resource. I'll come back either way, I guess. But I'm, I'm, I'll, <laughs> as, a, as a resource, uh, you have my contact information. I encourage any of you to reach out to me if that, if that would be helpful. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you everything I know. It won't take long uh, <laughs> about, about how to do this stuff right. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Our neighbors have already done this. They've come to policies that seem to be working for them. So, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, members of the commission, for your time. Answers. Thank you to Reading Light for all that you are doing to uh, scratch scratch that itch uh, of whatever you know. Again, price stability or environment or uh, good citizenship or whatever. Uh, if it's all right, I'm just going to hang out here for the. Oh, yeah. more yeah. please do. Yeah. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay, it looks like the next item is um, to get a report for the citizens, the CAB meeting, the Citizens Advisory Board. Who's that? Who's giving that report? Yep. Is that you, Tom? Yep. All right. I'm happy to do it. Uh, oh, did I skip something? Okay, I can do that right now. Okay, you're going to suggest a motion to. Um, 
Move that the board approve the meeting minutes of September 14th, 2017 and November 9th, 2017. Second. Uh, just one question. I'm, go ahead. What? The cab. Oh, I know, but she wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I was just trying to give you a cab. Okay. We'll go back to George. Okay. Oh, George, thank yeah. you for being here as a guest. Oh, thanks. <laughs> My cab. pleasure. Forgot to mention that. Um, I just had one question about the minutes. I'm quoted in here saying it's fine to spend an obscene amount of money on, on, on fiber. And I know I probably said something like that. Is that what I actually said? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, then, I guess I have to, item. I guess I have to, uh, you know, I have to stand by that, don't I? Um, I wouldn't want us to spend that much. <laughs> only if it was, only if the paybacks were there. Just Would you like us to edit Put that, that in the next I minutes. Right. All right. All right. Well, we can that, edit that one moment, that yeah. one comment. You don't have to. If I said it, I said it. I, I have to own it. <laughs> so. It sounds like something I would have said. Uh, anyway, okay. that's all. Okay. So um, is that the only comment? Yeah, that's fine. I'm so good. we can vote yep. on this motion. All in favor to move that these motions, I mean these minutes, be passed. Yep. Say aye. 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 Okay. All right. I guess um, this is the report to the chair. Is this you next, right? Do I, am I going out of order? No, I guess the, the comment I was making was usually the um, the cab okay. would would make any comments, um, and I just didn't want to get too far. That's all. I okay, to George, me. do you have any comments? From no, but I, I will say I okay. did appreciate uh, uh, his presentation here. The information is awesome. I can appreciate the passion that you have with it. Also, uh, I can see that. Uh, I, I wasn't aware, of course. I. I didn't receive a letter of that. And I would recommend you also reach out to uh, your member of the CAB. Uh, at any time you have any conversations or anything you want to bring up to them. So I would recommend that highly. That's all. Excellent. Thank you. Would you like me to report and on that? Yeah, you're going to report okay. on that. Yeah, so uh, I attended uh, the January 17th CAB meeting with George and the rest of the members that were present. And uh, a lot of discussion, the Colleen gave a storm report and there was uh, uh, some discussion on better outage management. They talked about a lot of the things happening uh, that the Mead and others are working on to uh, make things more uh, automated and more uh, responsive. And uh, we also talked about the uh, liaison phone, which I know Joyce has communicated back out for mm -hmm. them. Uh, town and also board members and cab members, which is great. And some additional discussion on the platform that drives all that surveillance, I think it's called. So, uh, and then uh, we had a lot, of, we did some discussion on solar and uh, the uh, second, uh, second rollout of our solar choice program. So that seems to be going well, Jane. And then uh, Colleen gave a, a little bit of an update on the organizational uh, study and report. Good meeting. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. And now we go to Colleen, right? Yes. I All right. Thank you for, we'll do our due diligence to look at that. And um, I do know that a lot of some of the municipals are, are reevaluating their solar rates. I don't know where they're going with them, but we've had a number of uh, municipal meetings where because it's it ranges the gambit we're trying to make sure that um, you know that they're appropriate, as you know, as Jane said. There's a lot of components that go into them, of the calculation. So um, we want to make sure that it's it's meeting our our um, our goals of, uh, of of the rate structure that we set forward for the next three years. So we'll be taking a look at this, and, and Jane will be reaching out to you and having discussions with you. Okay, thank you, though. Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah, do, Colleen, uh, <coughs> sort of piggybacking on George's comment I can't remember if the cab was copied on Dave's letter but would that be appropriate to give the cab members a copy of David's letter because that's of John's letter yeah John yeah yeah um, I don't have a problem with that I'm not sure I know the exact answer if it's addressed to myself and the Board of Commissioners it, it generally goes in that direction yeah. and then um, you know but I can talk to the chairman as things come in and say, do you want to pass this along, yep. not pass it along? I can make sure that we do that going forward 
Yeah, no, I was just uh, talking about this particular one because it seems yeah, to connect Yeah, certainly with, we could have passed this yeah. along to the cab. Um, I, it, it was a good letter. There was a lot of information in it, and as you said, there was kudos. There was a lot of um, constructive uh, information, and in, in we've, we've spent a lot of time going through it. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't pass it along to the cab. I apologize. So going forward. Sorry for calling you Dave. we got too many Daves. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> i got to take back my signature. We gave him too many Daves. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, not to go off track, but I have a question about it, if I may. Yes. Is the overall concern that we get to a threshold where it's 5% or it's 10% and it's it's a problem for the system to have the incoming electricity at noon on a June Sunday or something? Is that the um, overall thing that we're no, worried about? That, that's one component is you have to have electrical stability uh, per feeder of what feeders can handle, of what the system can handle. So you have some limitations and restrictions. Um, you know, in, in, in some cases that could be a concern. You can... You know, Jane's going to talk later. We, we may have some large solars that are coming online that may be, you know, stress the actual capacity of a cable. So you do have those kind of limitations. But I think what we're talking about on this side is, um, you know, a, a kilowatt for a kilowatt, uh, you know, that type of, of exchange. And... Um, you know, you have distribution components to pay for the wires. We have to recover our cost of production. That's the law, okay? And when we have talked about the rates, we've discussed move, moving subsidations in line because those have migrated. So we have to look at the solar and we have to look at the components of what that value is being put back on versus what's coming off. And we have to go through each of those components. Um, to give you an example of one of the things Jane and I spoke about is, you know, we, we look at an on and off peak distribution charge. That's not really ris realistic because distribution doesn't have an on peak and an off peak. The cost of the wires and maintaining them is the same. So that's the wrong thing that's being toggled. So we have to look at other components that need to be toggled appropriately and then add the other components like capacity and whatever and add it up and see how it goes. I mean, I wrote the one in Danvers, so I know that there's different ones that are out there, but everybody ha every municipal also has a different, um, you know, d does some of these have generator components where they're charging a, a separate demand charge in addition to the net metering charge. So you have to look at each one of these and see how they're recovering each of the components and valuating it, and I think a lot of the municipals are getting ready to do that. Because even though we're not ready to be saturated at all, you still have to plan for the future because you don't want to knee jerk and turn around and say, oh, we, didn't, we weren't covering for that. Now we're not recovering our production costs. And then it looks like we're penalizing people that are putting in solar. But, you know, solar, I mean, the SRECs are, I mean, a lot is changing with the solar. And, it's, and it, it is something that, you know, may not have as much of a cost benefit as it has an environmental benefit to it. And every, all the managers are looking at that. So some of these may change. They may be tweaked. Ours is going to be tweaked. And um, well, does, I don't know if that explains it. it. So there's two sides it's of it. Me's working on yeah. one side. Jane's working on the other. And we're trying to make, make it work. I guess my only thought is if all the numbers stayed the same, but you made it monthly rec reconciliation instead of minute by minute, and that was beneficial to the customer, it would seem to me that would be that, that the thing where you get concerned is if at the minute by minute, you have times when it's when it's stressing the system you could set some percentage limits where if there's generation beyond a certain point then then some penalty kicks in but short of that moving rec reconciliation to monthly versus minute to minute would seem to me to be a reasonable thing to do because you're not penalizing somebody for having a lot of load overnight i'm gonna let jane but answer that one because yeah. i i think the way the way yeah you're asking again that's, that's a financial settlement we're still delivering to them right kilowatt hours and, and again, so you're going from a, a like a, a real model to a financial model in that case. You know, in, in, the, in the case that we're doing right now, it's measuring what is uh, what the customer at any moment is purchasing from us, and it's measuring what they're putting back for us. So if we were to net those two, then we're basically doing a financial settlement of that account, and and so we're, you know, 
they're using their their power that they generated during, during the day. It's like we're we're banking it, or we don't have a battery storage that we can save it up and then put it back out there. We're just financially doing that. So we, we'll we'll look at that. Um, but again, when we set it up, that wasn't the intent. Um, and there's different parameters, um, and so there's no. We're not fixated on any which way. We'll, we'll take a look at that scenario and do the comparison in terms of the costs and, and make sure that the customer is being allocated, you know, the benefits as well as the costs that, that, are, that are necessary. So again, I don't want to preclude anything to say we won't do it. I think it has to, everything needs to be vetted. Okay. Thanks. Good. Everything's on the table. All right, Colleen. Yes, I just have two quick um, requests. Um, um, <clears throat> actually, I've never really gone any place since I've gotten here except for the legislative committee. And um, so we had such a success last year of me going to Washington and speaking uh, on behalf of uh, Reading Light and some of the other municipals to um, retain local control and to, um, you know, basically tell the legislative body that we're not an IOU and we, our renewable portfolio is um, I explain what it is and why we should be uh, exempted from some of the s more strict um, uh, protocol that I think we're already doing and, um, and, re and again, retaining the local control. And, you know, I wrote letters that I had sent to you guys, copies um, to the senators, um, uh, and it went really well. So they're asking if I will come back again this year and um, and help for the cause and um, for you know public power and and because um, we don't really have a voice unless unless we go together as a body of up to 42 municipals in the state. A lot of legislation legislation gets written and we are uh, just either scooped up in it and then we're stuck with something that we can't afford. Um, and in this case, it's, it's to let them know. I mean, we did a lot of work and press releases uh, for the million dollar grant that we just got. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was a real eye opener to, um, to a lot of the legislation. And, and, um, and I think it's moving us in the right direction. So if, if you would be um, willing to allow me to go back to that, uh, that's at the end of February. And then I had already mentioned to you um, at the beginning of February, we have, we're building the first, um, you know, the five megawatt battery storage. And I was going to Nextera to the trading floor because of the new power supply strategic um, plan that we have. Jane was gonna come, but she's tied up. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a conference and a training that they're putting together for me specifically. So um, if you would, um, I really haven't had any career development training or any travel or anything. So I'm asking that you would uh, authorize my travel uh, out of state for those two purposes. Okay, should we make a motion? Yeah. Okay. You want to read that one? Sure. Uh, so for the uh, next era energy marketing public power summit uh, between February 4th and February 7th in Minopolon, Florida, move that the board approve uh, Ms. O'Brien's travel to and attendance at the next era Energy Marketing Public Power Summit in Manalapan, Florida from the February 4th to February 7th, 2018. Second. Second. Any discussion? That sounds like a good idea. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. You're traveling, Colleen. The uh, do the second, second uh, motion, uh, move that the board approve Ms. O'Brien's travel to and attendance at the uh, APPA Legislative Rally in Washington, D.C. from February 25th to March 1st, 2018. Second. Dave's got the second. And uh, all in favor? Yeah. Aye. All right. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll report back as on, uh, probably give a presentation when I get back on both of the uh, trips. Okay. And I don't, do we ever in this setting, Colleen, ever talk about the grant, the million dollar grant? In the board setting, I don't know if we've done that before. Um, I thought we did. We did. Okay. We did. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. Good. And the RMLD response to the storm. Mr. Chair, so maybe John, are you aware of that, John? Yeah. Okay. Good. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. And the response to the storm, is that you, Hamid, or is that you're going to continue? Um, well, the last storm, we didn't really have much. We had, in Reading, we had two commercial customers that were out. They were isolated. Um, some taps burnt off. But all in all, we, it, was, it wasn't like the previous Christmas storm. Um, we fared very well. We were properly prepared. We had the new liaison phone, but it just, uh, not, not much happened. So it was good. Excellent. And now, Jane, I think you're up again. I'm going to just have Joyce do the community relations. Oh, okay. And sure. Come up. That's okay, Karen. Karen. That's, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Joyce. Thank you. Just a few updates tonight. Um, so the elementary student art contest wrapped up with two award ceremonies. So thank you for those who were able to attend. Um, I think it was pretty re well received by the parents and the kids. So it was a nice couple of events. Um, the high school student art contest is ongoing. Uh, we're holding info sessions at the schools this month. And we'll hold a final info session here at RMLD. Um, and then the kids will have a few months to do their art and they'll turn it in, in April. So we'll see what we get from that. Mr. Chair, um, just a quick yeah. comment. Sure. Uh, so I was had the opportunity to attend. So it really, uh, for those who weren't there, it was really gratifying to see the young kids uh, display their work and uh, and really the maturity of the, the kids that get up there because they part of the presentation is, you know, they have to give a little uh, talk about what they what their picture represents and uh, you know some of them are quite quite eloquent and uh, for third graders right yeah. uh, third and third fourth, and fourth yeah. Reading. so uh, it, was, it was well done and, and Joyce you, you and your team did a great job it was Thank you. Uh, nicely done and a lot of comments which I shared with Colleen afterwards around people's satisfaction as, as John you've highlighted with the RMLD both in terms of service uh, rates but uh, you know mostly uh, the service piece because they really appreciate the ability to have uh, power when other, other towns may not so good thank you um, we held a Save Energy and Money info session here at RMLD last night. Um, topics were uh, just residential, uh, things like rebates, Shred the Peak, Solar Choice. We went over some energy efficiency tips. Um, it was pretty well attended. We had over 40 customers come in last night. So it was, it was a nice event. Um, we also have a website update that's in progress, and I would expect we'll have uh, the website, the new website, up and running in a few months. What will we see in the, the new website? The new website, it's mostly to improve the ease of navigation, make it more intuitive, make it more visually appealing, mm -hmm. streamline the content. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Joyce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to report on uh, November 2017 Purchase Power. Um, so what we did for this month's slide is we looked at uh, hydro, uh, solar, and wind uh, projects within our power supply portfolio. Um, it was a, a topic of discussion at one of the previous meetings, so we wanted to kind of inform um, our, our customers as well as the, the commission. Uh, so this looked at our hydro power within our portfolio, and it looked at the time period from 2013 to 2017. And as you can see, um, back in 2013, uh, our hydro represented about 5.75% of our overall portfolio. Uh, and that's increased significantly to over 13% um, in uh, 2017. Uh, we've negotiated several contracts with uh, developers of, of hydros. Those developers are extremely happy with the purchase power agreements. They're able to take those agreements two banks get refinancing because of the revenue streams that those projects provide the, the developers. Um, and that keeps those projects online and it avoids, you know, more <coughs> costly generation that has to be produced. <clears throat> the next slide looks at uh, RMLD's wind. Uh, back in 2013-14. Jane, one question. Sure. So you're saying is it 13 percent of our total megawatt hours are produced by hydro? Correct. In the month of November. Yep. For that one month? Correct. Okay. And again, it fluctuates. Hydro is very seasonal. It, you don't have a lot in the, in, in the summertime. It tends to be a little drier. But in the winter, in the spring, when there's more rain, uh, there's higher portions of generation. Yeah, Tom has a question too. Yeah, so 
any reason why so if it, it was increasing significantly 13 to 14 Jane then the next two years that that could be related to the weather you know as I said you know we need some rain or a, a cold winter with a lot of snow to increase the water levels for the hydros um, so a lot of that is weather dependent and I think the big increase is the fact that we've signed more contracts so we have more contracts so it's a combination of weather and the contract correct plan. okay correct um, the next slide looks at wind. Uh, prior to 2014, RMLG had no wind projects within the portfolio. We have si since signed two contracts, one with Jericho Wind, which is located in Berlin, New Hampshire, and Saddleback Wind, which is up in Maine. Um, and those have been increasing steadily. Um, those are, you know, mountain projects, and RMLG is very pleased with the output of those projects. But uh, that represents 3% in 2015, and that's up to a little over 4.5% in 2017. The final slide looks at solar power. Uh, RMLD is very much committed to <coughs> solar power. Uh, we had really n n on, a, on, a, on a purchase power agreement portfolio. Uh, 2013, we, we negotiated with several developers. Um, those projects never came to fruition. Finally, in 2015, we were successful to have a two megawatt solar uh, installation at one Burlington in Wilmington. Um, so that came in, and since that, we have two other projects. Uh, we have our community solar at 326 Ballardville, um, and then our second community solar project at 4050 um, is up and running. So uh, that has increased, and that represents still not a lot, uh, about 0.47. And again, solar is intermittent. We're talking November. The sun isn't out as long. Um, and so um, it's a good trend that that, that, that show. That chart is particularly showing. Um, and Jane, I, one question. Of sure. the three that you just highlighted, where do you think you see the most growth as a percentage of our total? Well, it would be the total. larger one. So so the two the two megawatt project at one Burlington, that's been steady, it's run, it's got all the kinks out. Um, the, the 326, that's been on for over, you know, eight months. Again, we're getting good results from that project, and I'll talk about it a little when we go to the solar choice rate. Yeah. Um, and then the 40-50, it's that one's just starting. So. I meant actually uh, comparing hydro, wind, and solar. Where do you where do you see the growth for us as percentage of our total? Uh, well, there's limited hydro that we have access to. Um, uh, wind is probably the, the largest, and we ha we have some solar. So uh, the the problem with the solar is its its capacity factor is fairly low. So if you look at a capacity factor, solar tends to be anywhere from 12 to 15 percent of the project because that's when, you know, we're in New England, there's not a lot of sun. Um, wind is around a 35 to 40 percent capacity factor, um, and hydros can be a little higher because, you know, the, the water's running. So mm. they're all very different, yeah. so it, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges yeah. to okay. bananas. Thanks. Um, the last chart looks at all of the three combined, <clears throat> and it looks at the total being the 18 percent. When you combine the, thir uh, the six, 6,700 megawatts of hydro, the 2,300 of wind, and the 246 of um, solar in 2017. So it's an upward trend. I think uh, it just shows that as a municipality, we're really committed to renewable projects um, and that we're always looking for cost-effective ones to include in the portfolio, and we will continue to do that to balance you know, the renewable aspect with the, the cost pro portion of it. Yeah, Tom. And so, Jane, when, when w might we see the battery storage on the show? Yeah, so we, 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 uh, we're meeting on that. The project is ongoing. Uh, the current anticipated schedule is that the unit will be installed and running by December of this year. Um, so that's the current plan. Uh, we're hoping maybe it'll be a little sooner, um, but that, that's what we're projecting right now. We're in and the that pro has, that has the uh, ability to be a strong contributor there, correct correct we're very excited about that project and that that will be another added benefit that we'll have in, in these slides good thank you i have a question I may. um so i know we we routinely sell our recs right uh correct so doesn't that impact what we can say we're using in terms of renewables yeah, I, I didn't call these green, and I think that's the disconnect in terms of calling them green attributes because that's what the renew, uh, the RECs provide. Renewable is the type of generation, uh, and, and so I don't want to mislead the public in terms of saying, you know, RMLD is being, you know, 
18% green or anything. I'm just I'm talking about the renewable projects within uh, the portfolio. So the carbon benefits transfer to the entity that purchases the RECs. The, 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 ab the ability for them to call themselves green, so correct. The word that's used in these contracts is green. In the, in the sales of RECs, it's called, I believe that's the word, green. Well, they, they use them to meet their renewable portfolio standard. Right, Renew um, renewable portfolio standard, right. So right. Renewable. So I, my, my understanding of, of REC sales is that the, the entity buying the RECs is the one who can claim that they're using, in effect, or using renewable. Correct, correct. There's entities out there that will go and purchase RECs and say, you know, they're able to market the fact that, you know, my company is 100% green because right. they, they, they purchase RECs. So the entity that sold them, i.e. RMLB, can't do that anymore. Yeah, and we don't have RECs with all of these. Uh, so, for example, when we negotiate a purchase power agreement, uh, several of the hydros were buying the energy from that. Um, and, and those contracts are what they're able to take to the bank, um, and, and, and they, t they deal with the RECs separately. So, again, I would just be curious to know, when you back out what we can't claim because we've sold the RECs, what does that number go to, the percentage, from the 18 percent to what? You mean what is the percentage? No, I'm sorry. May I yeah. speak? Yeah. You mean what is the percentage of true green? Well, uh, yeah, but it's renewable portfolio. It's I don't think the word green is in these contracts. I mean, it's wondering what is yeah, if that's the language. But right. What if you're saying that we retire the recs, and yep. this I guess was a big Sell huge them. discussion before I got back hired in 2012. Here. Uh -huh. um, and probably John Stempeck would be best to yeah. describe it. But the discussion was, um, you know, do you retire the recs? To consider yourself green, or do you sell the RECs and offset your rate to keep your prices uh, down? Right. And that was the whole discussion. No, I get that. I, okay. I, I know that that all happened. And but I know you're that saying we what made, percentage are once we, we did that, we made the policy, policy decision that we sell RECs at RMLD, whereas other, other MLPs are buying them for the opposite purpose so that they can get their numbers up, like Hingham, and, and others are, are buying them and trying to get up to 100%. So once we do that and we're selling ours, what does our true percentage get to? So there's the amount, that's what I'm trying to find out. I know, out. it's just interesting because Hingham is now carbon, car, they're carbon free. Is yeah, I don't think they're buying they, recs, but they are, but they're them. not, right. but they're, they're also buying a type of rec that's a very inexpensive rec. There's okay. so many different types of recs. Um, but just to, to clarify, what we're providing is still green in the renewable. I, I don't call it green, uh, no, Tom. Saying, I, 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 again, I call it renewable because it's wind, hydro, solar. But I mean, and if not, that's no. not renewable, I'm not sure. And again, I, I'm making no um, uh, caveat that RMLD is being, quote, green or I'm... I, I'm, I'm right. I guess what I'm saying is uh, some of this is, is definition of to, to the average person, green means you're providing, uh, you know, energy that's wind, power, solar. Again, renewable. that's changed a lot, right. though, Tom, but I mean, because, but of, but because of the introduction of renewable energy certificates. And so, again, I think it's, it's up to the RMLD to be very clear. And whether, you, again, I'm not, make, I'm not referring to renewable energy certificates in this presentation. I'm renewing... I'm referring to the energy associated with these types of projects. I agree, but uh, just so the public isn't confused, I mm -hmm. mean, it doesn't mean that we're, we're providing uh, n uh, unfriendly environmental uh, energy. Correct. The, fact, these projects are running, and when these projects are running, mm -hmm. that means they're displacing right. so other the projects. Only, the question is, the, 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 the REX, to me, is a, is a side discussion on on uh, so, uh, the finances around it, but it's it, the energy is. That was that what that was the purpose of this presentation yeah, just to talk to about see, energy. It, it, yeah, yeah, but I don't want people. To, uh, I know you know that, Dave, but uh, we don't want people to think that uh, because we do or don't have Rex as part of this, that that in some way uh, diminishes the the value of what we're doing. Well, no, no, no. I, I want to clarify what my question is. There's a percentage that our power comes from these sources, but then we've sold Rex for a lot of them. And that, that drops the percentage down in terms of what we can claim is actually a renewable portfolio at RMLD because we've sold that right off to somebody else. I just want to know what the two percentages are. One is the one that comes from the source, and the other is the one after you back out the fact that we've right. sold. And I don't have that number. That's all I'm asking. Okay. It's not yeah. all renewable? 
Dave is asking how many wrecks have we retired? I'm yeah, asking what does it do to our percentage? It I does know, something very real to it. Yeah, but you're making somebody it else can claim that, and we can't. I and I'm just trying to get to the what, what we can legitimately claim versus what is just from the source, but we sold the wrecks. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference, and it is a real thing. But the wreck or no wreck, it's all renewable, whether you sell or don't sell a wreck, isn't it? The, can I? Can you explain this, the wreck this is, concept? This is actually one of the reasons why I went down to Washington, okay? It's up to the board to decide what part of our portfolio would you like it to be produced by renewable and what part of the portfolio would you like it to be what they would call green. That means that it's being produced by renewable and you're retiring or retaining right. the, 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 the wreck that, that it's a certificate saying no, this yeah. unit is green. I, I understand. Okay? I think what maybe Dave, you so, missed, Dave made a comment that separate renewable from non-renewable, but I'm saying it's all renewable, whether it's green is the question. Right? That's right. And we want to retain the local yeah. control so that the state I, isn't telling I, us I and you would make a policy as to what you want that percentage. Right. But some of the other utilities, like Hingham, just went to 100% carbon free. Okay, that's not the same as, you know, that takes into consideration nuclear and, and other things, which is another thing that we're talking to the legislation about. Can we take credit for carbon free, meaning our municipal, our, our nuclears? Yeah. So there's a whole. Bill? Yes, hi, it's me. Welcome to the meeting, Hello. Phil. Hi, Phil. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm living with you, gentlemen, but I'm still in the, uh, the seven days since I uh, caught the flu, so I'm still contagious. So unless you want me to show up with a mask, I, I couldn't be there tonight. Okay, well, so, no. thank you thank for, you for not coming. Thank you, Phil, for protecting yeah. us. <laughs> Okay, so I just I just got into the airport two minutes ago. So, all right, very good. I just wanted to let you guys know, and you know, I hope I didn't disturb anything, and you're doing all good work. Okay. Okay. Very thank good. You. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I'm happy to be a resource right. if it's appropriate on this question. Very good. It's hard to hear. It's we, hard to hear you guys, to be honest with you. Um, uh, if so. you want to explain the for the you know people that might be hey, watching Phil. the wreck concept, I think that's good, renewable energy certificate concept. I mean, there's a few people here that know all about it, but we'd love to get your comments. Sure. Uh, again, John Rogers, 39 Tower Hill Road, North Reading. Uh, so this is uh, Mr. O'Rourke's right. I mean, this is, a, so this is purely a financial construct. What we decided as a society, and Massachusetts sort of pioneered this back in around 1998, was when a wind turbine generates power, it's different from power from a coal plant. It's different from power generated by a natural gas plant. What we decided was that wind turbine produces two things. One of it is energy, and the other is this package of environmental, a package of attributes, whatever, and you can imbue various attributes depending on the state. Uh, but the whole, and the purpose of that was so that utilities could comply with the new renewable portfolio standard in Massachusetts. First, first state in the nation to do this across the whole state, um, and we needed a mechanism to do that. You're not going to take a wire and connect it to every wind turbine, you know, connect it from there to your system. So we needed a, uh, a, uh, a financial mechanism, a rule of law mechanism for doing this. That is imbued in the REC. That is embodied in the REC. And so what's left, so you have the REC, and then you have the rest of it. And the rest of it is just system power. It happens to be produced by something with spinning blades that's turned by the wind. But, but uh, Dave Talbot is, is right. It's, it, what's left over is not, you can't call it renewable, you can't call it green, because somebody, you, if utilities buy that, they're using it to comply with uh, the state renewable portfolio standard or another state's renewable portfolio standard. Other people are buying it, though. A major driver of the market is the voluntary purchases. And I will bet that there are households and businesses and institutions in RMLD's territory that go out and buy RECs. I certainly did. You know who I bought them from? Reading Light. So the Green Choice Program was exactly about this. It was a terrific. This was the, I would guess this was the first muni to do something like that in the state. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2006? 
When did Green Choice start? So. 2006, Redding Light said, look, we get it. Some people want to green up their power. We're going to make it easy for you. We went out. We went out and entered into contracts for, it was originally from biomass, then it was from wind power from Maine, and we sold those, Reading Light sold those recs to householders, households like me. And so we were, that, that had all the attributes. So uh, Dave Talbot is exactly right, that once you, once you then, once we don't hold on to those, once we don't retire them, it's not about greenness, it's about, it's about making the claim about whether we have renewable energy or not. So that wind power, it may have been wind power when it came in because we had the wrecks. Then the windness, the greenness, the whatever, went with those wrecks. So if we don't hold those wrecks, we can't make the claims. And the Federal uh, Trade Commission is quite clear on this. You know, they have said, if you are pretending that you're, you're saying you're making your Cheetos with 100% wind power and you don't hold on to the wrecks, you're not making it with wind power. So. Uh, and, the, and, and Reading Light made the decision to sell the recs, and that's fine. What it does mean is that Jane is being very careful with how she pitches this, and you do have to be careful. So there is a question about, uh, you know, you could look at, so this is how much we buy from stably priced spinny things. This is how much is renewable because, we have, because we've held onto the rec and we've retired. We haven't sold it. So the rec is an important thing from a rule of law perspective because that is the only way we have of giving somebody, whether it's a utility that's doing it for compliance purposes, or a household, or a business, or the U.S. Navy, or Wells Fargo, that is wants to make claims, wants to green up, not just make claims, but actually green up its power. So Hingham may be doing it on the cheap. You could do that. You could buy wind wrecks from Texas where they aren't worth much, or they're whatever. Not claiming I, to, they're claiming to be carbon free. Okay, so carbon free. Their first phase of, of yeah. So whatever. you could have nuclear, you could have hydro, you could do other things. But but if you if you want to claim to be 100% renewable, you got to have either that wind turbine right there, and you're not selling the wrecks, or you've got to buy the wrecks to cover it. And again, a lot of people, a lot of individuals make that choice. And the only way they can make that choice, the only way they can make that claim, is if nobody else is making that claim. Again, Reading Light crossed that bridge. Uh, at once, five years ago, when it decided to sell those wrecks, it was contentious. I was here for that. Uh, uh, it can, it, but it can revisit that and decide that you want a true renewable portfolio standard. That's going to mean not just buying, and it's great that you're entering into the con contracts. These will continue to be stably priced sources of power, predictable sources of power. That's really important. That's different from a renewable portfolio mm. Good. standard. That's really helpful. You know, all, yeah. all I want to know is, is all I want to know is there's a percentage that comes from these sources but because we've sold the recs, what is the final percentage that we actually can legitimately claim is renewable in our portfolio at, after having sold the recs? That's what I, all I'm trying to find out because there is a very real difference in those two numbers and I just want to know what it is. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Can we reserve the right to have you as an expert witness uh, a little bit later? You may. <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. You have more? Okay, yeah, the only other uh, presentation I have for the board is our solar choice rate. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we presented this to the CAB um, at the last meeting, and we're looking to refile the solar choice rate. Um, as a, just an overview, um, solar choice one uh, is fully subscribed. That's got 500 customers that have been signed up for that. That system has been online since June of 2017. Um, when we first set up the rate and projected that, we had anticipated that the costs, the differential between the fuel charge and the solar PPA um, would be an incremental cost of about $5 a month. Um, after the first seven months of actual performance, we've looked at the capacity benefit, the transmission benefit, <clears throat> um, as well as the cost differential between the fuel charge and the PPA, um, and those savings are greater. Um, so we're currently uh, going to file the new rate and requesting that the rate drop from the cost drop from five dollars to one dollar for Solar Choice One, um, and we we made modifications to the rate so that any project, the first six months will be set at the five dollars, and then each project gets trued up on the actual performance. So that's the first part of the change. <clears throat> Uh, Solar Choice 2 is uh, currently online and we're looking to fill up, finish the subscription. Uh, we have approximately 560 uh, customers signed up. We're hoping to get 660 customers total. So we're at 85%, which is uh, <coughs> extremely well. 
Um, so if anyone's interested, they can go on the website, um, and we're hoping to have um, good results with that project as well. <clears throat> Uh, and, how, and Jane, how long has that been available to subscribe? What, oh, 85%? We just started in the fall for that. Um, okay. So we, we, we negotiated the contract, um, I want to say, in like May or June. And then we started setting up for signing, asking customers to sign up probably in the fall. So we've gotten a very positive response. We yeah. actually had customers who attended our energy saving tips last night actually sign up as well. So. Can people that signed up for the first one do the second? Or are you Correct. reserving it nope. just for? Nope. Uh, you cannot sign up for multiple shares, but you can sign up for multiple projects. So we have quite a few customers who are Solar Choice 1 customers who have actually signed up for Solar Choice 2. Uh, so that is an effect, but you can only have one share per project. Um, the other uh, change that we're making to the Solar Choice rate is we're adding a Solar Choice business portion of the rate. And that's basically for small and medium commercials so that we can give them the ability to, because they're a commercial size, you know, a $5 added on their bill and then an incremental charge maybe not, may not be cost effective. So we're bundling five shares of that or it would be five solar choice features. So they'll get a charge of $25 for the first six months and then it would get trued up. Um, the way the state has developed com commun community solar is no one customer can own more than 50% of any one community solar project and uh, no, no more than 50% of commercial customers, excuse me, I, I correct that, can be um, part of a project and no one customer can have more than 25% share. Commercial customers commercial can only make customers. up 50% correct. of any one project. Exactly. I thank you for that correction. Um, so we're so that's why we're developing the solar choice business, and then we're also adding a solar choice business plus for the large commercial customers. If they're interested and it's available, they could take up to a portion of that, not to exceed 25 percent. So those are ba the basic changes to the rate. We think they're all positive, and we're very happy with um, how this rate is being received by our customers um, and the progress of the the first the, the solar choice one project. Right. Thank you. So the message is sign up for Solar Choice 2. Correct. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So you just need to vote on that rate. Oh, we should do that right now. Yes, please. Dave, you got this one? Do I have it? I think I do. Uh, any. Um... It's, uh, I can read it. On the bottom. Turn it on your agenda. Um, <clears throat> move that the board of am I reading the motion? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Move that the board of commissioners adopt solar choice rate MDPU number two seventy eight, dated to be effective February one, twenty eighteen, on the recommendation of the general manager. Um, second, the motion. Second. Okay. Discussion. Any, any discussion? Discussion. No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank sure. you. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay, the financial report. Wendy, let's talk numbers. Good evening. Hi, Hello. Wendy. Tonight, um, reporting on the first five months of the fiscal year, ending um, November 30th. So I believe you have the financials in front of you on your tablets. Is that we do. correct? We okay, do. great. So first, looking at the statement of net assets, um, we just want to look at w which we normally look at is cash and receivables. And currently, uh, the RMLD is <clears throat> doing well. Our receivables are 95 percent current, uh, compared to last year at this time. We are up three percent. Wow. And this is in our moratorium. Um, season, so I, I think that's very impressive. Yes, it is. So I just thought I'd like very to good. point that out. Any um, reasons why we think we've been able to take that up to 98 percent? Um, I don't know, Jane. Do you think Maureen has any uh, extended efforts that? Yeah. So the, the, the customer service manager has been working diligently, reaching out to customers, setting all the <coughs> plans, um, getting customers to try to be current so that when the moratorium expires in April, uh, they're not subject to shut off because. The last thing that we want to do is shut off our customers for non-payment. So we try to work very closely with them in setting up some plans so that they're able to maintain their accounts current. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And then I'd just like to draw your attention to the uh, net plant. So um, our sources of capital currently are $6.7 million, and of that we have spent uh, $2.2 million, leaving us with a net plant, um, no, I'm sorry, leaving us with capital funds of almost $4.5 million. And if you look at the cash uh, from last year, you notice that our depreciation fund has uh, decreased, and that is simply due to all the capital projects and the spending that is going in that direction. Okay. Okay. So then if we move on to the, um, the actual year-to-date as compared to the budget, the FY18 profit and loss statement, um, you look at your PPCT, uh, purchase power capacity and transmission. Currently, we are under collected about $224,000. What, what slide are you on uh, right uh, now? We're, I'm on the um, actual year to date as compared to the budget FY18 profit and loss statement. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not looking at a slide. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm just looking at the financials in this moment. Okay. Would you prefer them to be up on the No, no, no. I just want to know where I'm supposed to be right now. Sure. So uh, just looking at the overall compared to the budget, um, so, the ac first of all, the actual, so we're under collecting about $224,000 um, in our PPCT, which uh, Jane um, compensates for monthly. And then if you look at the budget compared to the actual, you'll notice that uh, for the first five months of the year, we should have a remaining of about 58.3% uh, if we were to target our budget exactly and uh, power is, is pretty much on target. And then if you look at the operating and maintenance expenses as a whole, we do have 62.4% remaining of the budget. Now, um, that says something, but it could say nothing because it could be the timing of the projects that we just may not have gotten to yet. It could be the timing of payments, but uh, overall we are under budget consistently. So uh, it looks like um, we're standing strong on the, on the numbers that we gave you. So because it is, we are approaching budget season, I did uh, prepare this one slide. It does take a lot of effort to get this slide, um, to get the numbers, because we work on a FERC base, and then we want to show you these fixed costs versus the semi-variable costs uh, that are up on the, on the wall here. Th there's, a lot of, there's a lot involved to categorize, but I think it's important to see especially in this time of the, uh, this season, where the money's going uh, as a, as in a category based. So overall, the, of the $94 million budget, you first look quickly at the, um, the purchase power. It's about 74% of our budget, okay? And then, so the first, the top part are your fixed costs. Basically, there's no room for movement. So then you have your depreciation expense, which is about a little over 4.5%. Then you have your return on investment to the town of Reading, which is uh, about 2.5% of the budget. You have your four town payments, uh, your town payments in lieu of taxes to the four towns, uh, a little over 1.5%. And then, of course, at year end, we true up our miscellaneous deductions of uh, some disposal on, uh, losses on disposals, which, again, is uh, under a quarter percent. And then you get into your semi-variable costs. And the reason we call them semi-variable is because uh, you may think we have some leeway, but we really don't. So if you look at labor, first of all, you have three labor contracts. Um, so everything is, labor's pretty much, our hands are tied for the most part, okay? And then employee benefits goes along the same lines. We do follow um, the town of Reading benefit package. So there's about three and a quarter percent there. And then you have your other operating and maintenance expenses. And what that covers are any of the materials in the fields used to operate or maintain the uh, infrastructure, any kind of uh, operating expenses for our actual buildings and our substations, and any kind of operating expenses for our hardware and software infrastructure. So that's about 1.9 million or 2% of the budget. And you look at your conservation expenses, which uh, we do push out to our customers, and then we are expected to spend a certain amount of money. So it's about 1%. And then you have your overtime, which a lot of times uh, is needed to get through storms or get through uh, some projects that are pushed. And that's about uh, almost 1%. And then, of course, your tree trimming. 
is almost at 1%, which is an ongoing um, effort that we always talk about. And then you just get down, you know, you get down to these other uh, small categories of um, what's necessary to do business, your legal expenses and your contract services, your property insurance and office supplies, um, and then your training, tuition, reimbursement, and of course the cost of the, our fleet and um, um, some other uh, insurance, bad debt expense and rent expense. So I just wanted to give you this overall picture to remind you of um, the percentages of our FY18 operating budget and where um, where everything really goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question, yeah. huh? Yeah. Well, Wendy, uh, no, that's great. I, I followed mostly of what you said. Do we have that? I don't, I can't seem to find that. No, you yeah. don't. It's oh, only don't. up here. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you, could we get a car? Because that's, Absolutely. that would be useful uh, sure. outside of this meeting. That's, yes. That's a nice display. So along the lines of, uh, for the first five months, July through November, so th there's your actual uh, spending and again, what's remaining uh, of the budget. Great. So I just thought it would be a nice highlight yeah, to, yeah, uh, very to helpful. look at. Good. Any questions? Any questions for Wendy? No, that's good. You can send that to us. That'd be good. You can't see it? No. Oh, I can't see I it. I can see it. Okay. I guess it's, you're, you're just. You're younger than me. So you're just, no. well, you're a little further away. Little further yeah, away. It's, so so I forgot to make copies. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. I'll, get, I'll email it to you. Oh, okay. That. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. Thank, Thank you. Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Thank you for the report. A little bit, yeah. And uh, Hamid, you're up. All right. Oh, I thought you said it wasn't on the screen. That's what you're no. You can't really see it. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, you should have that in front of you. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I'm yeah, glad yeah. to provide you the report for the November 2017, ending 2017. Uh, as the, when they mentioned, you know, lots of our projects, they're really getting done in, uh, in starting spring, going to the summer. So most of the spendings you're going to see coming up uh, during that period. You've got lots of projects that they, they, they're going to get started. Uh, warm weather. Warm, warmer we weather, exactly. And some of these uh, uh, heavy projects, which is good. That's going to bring our plant value up, and that's what we all would like to see. So the first uh, slide, basically, it's giving you the uh, rundown of the capital improvement projects. Uh, uh, you see the percent completion on the left on the month of November, what the spending being, being the year-to-date actual, what was budgeted, and the remaining balance. There's a list of all of our projects. Some of them, they're ongoing, or some of them, they are, they are completed, as you could see the list. But uh, uh, overall, we're making a great progress. Uh, the next page you see the uh, these are the capital uh, the, the non-project capital improvements the stuff like you know the pole damages pole settings overhead underground uh, uh, failures we, we have from time to time and what we do we replace the cables the hazmat oil spill porcelain cutouts animal guards and all the other stuff that they're not really project related they go in this bucket called uh, routine uh, capital constructions and the spending for that in the month of November was uh, $134,948 that brings year to date to $546,813. The next slide you see the spend expenditures for uh, IRD, Jane's group and the IT department, the capital projects and uh, uh, for the month of November, as well as you know the, what was budgeted and the year to date actual, those are the numbers and what's remaining. Uh, in the bottom, you see that you know, in the month of November, we spent overall for all the projects uh, $584,377. That brings the year to date to 2236964 And uh, you could see that you know, the remaining balance is 5448557 which you're going to see that in expenditures uh, going up uh, in the summertime, you know, April going to, to the summer. Uh, the next slide is the routine maintenance. These are the number of programs that, you know, we have developed, and since then, really, the reliability has been getting better and better and making great progress on those for transformer replacements, pole inspections, the quarter inspections of the feeders that we do, uh, we just we tweaked it a little bit. That's what you see in the between month of the October to December. Uh, we have done some, but we are tweaking the program to get it even b better and capture more of those. 
but uh, that's been really paid back because we've uh, captured lots of uh, issues that you know could have been uh, leading to premature failures and we've caught them and we've fixed them. The manhole inspection going good, the porcelain cutout replacements were 91% completed. These are as the projects that you know we're doing upgrading the constructions, we're replacing the remaining. So there are some that left that you know very few uh, areas that getting fixed, they, they're getting replaced. Uh, the next one, next slide shows you the tree trimming, uh, the substation maintenance, also for the, uh, the, by the way, the tree trimming program is going very well. Uh, we were at the North Reading uh, the other night and, you know, I guess it got uh, noticed. One of the selectmen men mentioned that, you know, they're very pleased with the tree trimming program. We're glad to hear that. Uh, we hear that also from the other communities, and we haven't had any complaints. So that uh, expanding the radius of the cut from five feet to eight feet, it's really paid back, and it's it's making us, you know, uh, buying us more with the reliability. The substation maintenance, we infrared scan every uh, every piece. Hey, of I mean, what do you, how do you know that? How, like, um, how do you know that that the five going from five to eight has made an impact? Is it just it, it has because, you know, we don't see as many trees, and you're going to see that in the slide coming up, Okay, uh, right. that I'll, we don't have then. as many uh, tree uh, damages to the wires mm -hmm. because there's some areas that, you know, before we, we didn't have a database tracking the tree growth. Now that we have GIS, we can track the tree growth in the areas. And the program that we revamped, actually, what we did, we do the main feeders, and then we go to laterals, because that's you need to clear the main feeders because they were, they were all the feeders coming out of the substations they meet you need to get the backbone going before you can energize all the laterals and uh, uh, these are the ones that you know they're routed in the uh, heavy tre heavily treed areas and uh, now we, we were able also to uh, you know go to the five year cyclic program and we are monitoring the growth now through the GIS and the areas that we are doing it shows that you know it's paying back and you know we get the average of five years and we every year we're comparing ourselves to the average of five years and we see that those numbers going down and down obviously with one storm you know it, these are uh, extenuating circumstances right, right. all of a sudden they could go, oh, go up but but the trend been over the past uh, five years or so it's been going down uh, you're going to see that in okay. a little while good thank you for asking the substation maintenance, uh, we, every month we um, infrared scan the, every piece of the equipment the substations, and that's really paid back. O also, we've captured uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, potentially could have been issues, uh, but uh, not major ones, minor ones, but they're all fixed. Everything is fine. We haven't f found any troubles or hot spots, um, knock on wood. Uh, underground subdivisions upgrade. This is something that we instituted. This is n this, this is kind of new. What we are doing now that we have the GIS uh, uh, system completed, now we are prioritizing the underground subdivisions that they're old and we need to upgrade uh, the facilities in those areas. So uh, we got like about four, 50 or 60 communities that we are going to have to go through, and depending on the age, they're going by the prior priorities. We are upgrading everything, <coughs> and these are some of the ones that you recently completed. You see that Crestwood in North Reading, Aspen Road, Long Hill Lane. These are all completely reconstructed, and we got some sh uh, in uh, progress: Shasta Drive, Westover, uh, the Greenbrier Drive, the Great Neck Drive. Uh, Gandalf State and Deerfield Place. These are the ones that the crews are working to upgrade those and, you know, for their reliability. So, uh, again, that's good for the reliability of the customers and also making improvement and getting the numbers up on the plant values. <laughs> the next one shows the double poles, basically, for the benefit of the people that they, uh, they probably are, are not aware of the, the, the ownership and the custodial. <coughs> we got approximately 16,000 poles that the ownership is 50-50 with Verizon. The custodial in North Reading uh, uh, is uh, with RMLD and Reading is a split between RMLD and Verizon and the other two communities are solely the custodial is with uh, Verizon. The next one is my favorite uh, 
slide, and I guess everybody's asking about those. There are good things and bad things about those. You know, that's what I tell people. If you see the numbers are up, that means we're doing a great job because we are upgrading and, you know, we are uh, making improvements. It's good for the reliability. Some of those we don't have any controls over. If they, you know, the poles, they get hit or hit dead, then, you know, we're going to have to, you know, obviously that gives us even more opportunities to upgrade. Uh, so that's the way I look at it, the positive way. Uh, the RMLD in uh, uh, Linfield, we got about five poles, five transfers. In Reading, we got 21 transfers and 57 pole bots that we need to remove. We've had heavy constructions in Reading, <coughs> so that's why that number is up. North Reading, we got 33 <laughs> total, 13 transfers, 20 pole, pole, uh, pole bots that need, they need to be removed. Uh, and RMLD in Wilmington has a total of 35 poles, 31 transfers, and four pole bots. So we got a truck that is dedicated that they go around and they try, we try to do it, remove 10 a week. Uh, but, but this is a moving target. You're never going to bring it down to zero. So I just wanted people to be aware of that. Uh, so, but we're making steady progress on those. Uh, the next slide basically is showing you that, you know, the reliability-wise, we're doing really great. Uh, SADI, KD, and SAFI, you know, we are well below the regional average and the national average. So, and you see that the reliability is getting better and better. The two um, uh, indices that you're ready to track on is SADI and SAFI. And you see those numbers are really low and going in the downward uh, trend. Uh, however, uh, the KD could go up and down de de depending on when this, where the storm hits and when and how many storms you have. There's some communities that they don't have many damages depending on the storm path, some that they know they do. We've got, we got a large, very large territory, so we're doing very well for the territory that we are in. These are compared to like uh, the blood pressure. Anytime you know you go to the doctor, you're stressed out, the blood pressure goes up, but uh, over the you know period of the the days or after that, it goes back to normal. It's the same thing. Hmm. So the last slide, I guess we listened. Uh, our boss uh, didn't like the uh, pie chart. And, you know, well, she wanted to change that to the b bar chart. And This one here? Yeah. Okay. And since uh, I've learned a lot, you know, my wife has trained me really well not to argue. <laughs> <laughs> because they say what the happy wife happy life right <laughs> the happy boss happy work so <laughs> we listen <laughs> so these are the bar charts <laughs> Any comments that calling? shows <laughs> does everybody remember the pie chart and how <laughs> the pie chart stays round so no right. matter how much you decrease it it's, it's still, still a, a round it's pie, still a pie chart right so it Every time we did that, everyone would say, well, how do you know the tree's getting right. better? Mm -hmm. Now you can see it. <laughs> okay, now it's Good. clear. This so is to my question earlier, right? That's right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Okay. Are you happy I now? see that. Yes, Good. because now you can see it. You Good couldn't job. see it with the pie chart. I didn't hear right. the scream. That's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> She's right. It was clear. <laughs> Okay, yep. there you go. This That's your answer. Uh, you see that the trees for, we had 35 so far. Uh, uh, and, you know, we had 55, uh, the average was 55. So that For the last five years, it was 55, five then years, it dropped right. this year to So everything 35. you see, all the numbers, they going down compared to. And you think the eight, the go to five foot to eight that. feet it was did. a the yeah. big reason for Actually, that. I wanted to, we wanted to go to 10 feet. That's what most utilities, that's a standard practice. Yeah. But we know Reading is the tree city of America and also, you know, the other communities. We don't want to be too harsh, but, you know, we want to be friendly to the environment, really so we the respect city, that. For the tree city of America? That's what. No, I think that's, um, that's what they're noted for, right? Yeah. Right. That's what the All notion right. is. That's good. <laughs> so we want to be good neighbors for the community, even uh, tree Just the trees. Just put the difference yeah, between that's right. five and ten. So I'm we off. figured I'm off. five to, you know, go to seven to eight feet, it's, it's a reasonable place to be. So. All in all, it's good if you don't have any questions, any, any concerns. Well, any anybody? George? No. You typically deal with the tree wardens in each yes. community on these here. The way we, what we work, first of all, we, we actually post the map of the area that for the week, for the month that we are going to be on the streets, it's on the website. So the people, they could go and see exactly where we're going to be, where the tree trimming is going to happen. 
And prior to tri doing the trimming, uh, our three uh, ex experts or the three uh, liaison, which is Matt Braun, he is contacting the three wardens and letting them know this is where we're going to go. They're going to go down these streets. They're going to go over that to together, making sure they're fine, everybody is okay with it, and then they roll off and then they take care of them. So it's a good process. That's why we haven't had, since we started the program, I guess we had only th three or four, not even that, complaints. But I guess the people now, they're used to it, they're happy, I guess. That's good. And it looks like you want us to buy something here. What one, which one is that? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the bid. Yes. <laughs> I was using informal language. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> that's right. Need the motion? Yes. Could you? I will. Okay. Uh, move that proposal 2018-26 for 35 kV underground cable be awarded to Wesco Distribution for $60,300 pursuant to MGL Chapter 164, 56D, on the recommendation of the general manager. Okay, and Dave, second. I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? Is uh, just how many bids? Okay, they were, let me explain that a little bit. These are the cable, underground cables, and the railroad. We've got two express lines that goes from Station 4 to Station 5. Uh, that's the feeding Station 5, basically. The underground is aged, and it ne needed to be upgraded. So uh, we did part of it last year, and this, the second part we're doing it this year. And uh, there are 2,000 feet of basically in length, the three cables, three phases, 6,000 feet. And uh, we sent the bid out to 22 bidders. We got the response from the five. The lowest responsible, responsive bidder uh, was Wesco Distribution for $60,300. That was the lowest. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, we got uh, this thing back in 2010, the same cable, we paid uh, $11.87 a foot. And this time around, we paid, we're paying $10.05. Oh. <laughs> Everything's going up because the price of copper goes up and down. That's look, you see that most bidders now, they have a rider. Uh, they give you a fixed price plus a variable that you know uh, depending on surcharge, the time of the uh, surcharge. Yeah. Yeah. Zero surcharge. Okay. All in favor? All right. All right. Okay, that passed. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Really great work on yep. the, yes. the bomb cyclone and everything. Thank you. It's it's a team effort. Everybody's nice work. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. This is right here. Here, um, yeah. So you can you can just comment on the, on the on board meeting next board meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're just uh, updating the board meeting. Next one is Thursday, February twenty second, and the following one is on March twenty second. Um, oh, yeah. It was the fifteenth. Oh, the March one is going to the 15th. Okay. And then the cab meetings, we have Phil going on the 28th of February. Um, and then on the March 21st, John, maybe not John. I'll send out an email. Okay, we'll just, we'll do that. Yep. And then there's also a committee meeting, and I don't think anybody that's here is in that committee. Well, you might be, George. Are you part of that committee? I am. Yes. So there's a subcommittee on the payment that goes to the town of Reading. That's going to be on February 13th. I think it's you, um, John, Phil, Phil, town manager. So, so. Yeah, and Dan. Yeah, Neil. okay. Was, it, was Neil on that also? Yes. Oh, yeah, Neil from the, from the cab, Neil right. Cohen. Yep. Okay, great. We'll be looking forward to that report. And is there any other general discussion that anybody has to bring up? Uh, do, just so, Wendy, uh, the, are the board meetings correct in our I just want to make sure. Um, February 22nd, March 15th. I'm going to send out event invites. Um, okay. Usually they do, often do it Monday. Okay. But February's is the 22nd? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. I think that's, I think that's it. All right. Uh, 
motion to adjourn? Yeah, motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, move that the board go into executive session to discuss trade secrets or confidential, competitively sensitive, or other proprietary information in the course of activities conducted by a governmental body as an energy supplier under a license granted by the Department of Public Utilities and to consider the purchase of real property and return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. And a second? Second. All right. All in favor? I think it's a roll call. Roll call. Okay. Tom O'Rourke, aye. Dave Hennessy, aye. Talbot, aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.